it's like when I see you, I don't see the same thing I am. We're not the same, and we're never gonna be the same. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo, welcome to my channel. Hey yo, hey yo, listen up, listen up, Shit, you in charge of the girls, right? I am in charge of the girls. Are you in charge of the girls? I am in charge of the girls. Okay. Hey, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. I am your girl, Debbie and Nikki, the original wireless woman. And welcome back to my spot, room 303. You gotta love that new theme song. You got to. Like, you gotta love that new theme song. Welcome to season two of the wireless woman my wireless or nah season and it's it's basically like my versus season so everything that i've been seeing be a divisive element of the black community baby we gonna bring them in the room the upper room for what that upper room nigga the upper room and have these discussions so it's basically the wireless woman versus everybody and today I decided to have a conversation with my own daughter and this conversation really centers around the discussion of biracial versus black and as much as I have been the black woman who has raised her in her life we have constantly began as she grows and develops into her womanhood to have these discussions about her identity being so different from mine and what that means not just on a microchasm of our relationship but on the macrochasm of the black community as a whole we are dealing with a lot of conversations about whether or not biracial people get to embrace blackness the same way that fully black people do. Let's be honest, we've become gatekeepers of blackness. And I can't honestly say whether I think that's right or wrong. I think having these discussions is what opens us up to explore what are the lasting ramifications of the black community that we're currently building. So, I hope you enjoy the conversation. Make sure you drop your questions, your comments below, because I do plan to bring Shiloh back at some point in the season. But for now, you already know what time it is. What are we gonna do tomorrow night? The same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. It is time to call the roll, and I need all of my black and biracial females to the front of the class it is time to have this talk and it is time to read aloud everybody want to be black but don't nobody want to be a nigga uh. so welcome to another riveting episode of the wireless woman Today, I am being joined by my own daughter, Shiloh. Hi. And this particular episode is going to get into what it is in 2022 to be biracial, a perspective that I definitely have no experience with. However, I really wanted to delve into what the black experience is because more and more these conversations are coming to the forefront, especially for black women. Before we get into today's content, however, go ahead and do me a favor and like this video on the way in. Why? Because when you like it, well, I love it. This has been a subject that has continuously come up, I know, just within the black community. Well, first of all, let me give you the opportunity to introduce yourself, Shiloh. Hi, my name is Shiloh. I'm 16 and I'm a junior in high school. Um, I am biracial. My mother is black and my dad is Mexican. I identify as black. 
Um, however, if you ask me, I'll say, like, I'm biracial, my dad's Mexican. But if you just ask me, like, straight out, like, are you black? I'll say yes. And I know you and I have had discussions amongst ourselves. So I, I'm, I'm a big person on microchasm, macrochasm. So I know if we have different views on it, it probably is a much wider discussion going on. So we definitely don't speak for, you know, just the yeah. black and biracial community. But I just think it is, you know, just the ability to kind of look in on a, a portion of what that conversation looks yeah. like. Yeah, uh, a big point I wanted to make was I don't speak for any other biracial person, any other black woman other than myself. I definitely have had a lot of different views that um, are different like places that I've been even just at 16 that um, my mom hasn't had or other biracial people haven't had so I can only speak for myself and what I believe about myself so mm -hmm. I definitely don't want to say I speak for every biracial person because me and uh, my brother have completely mm -hmm. different experiences yeah right I think there's a gender component to that as well as far as how we experience blackness and I think we're even seeing that a lot you know even with just black people and now you add the component of you know biracial against the backdrop of white supremacy and you you really have a very complex conversation and how the topic of this particular podcast came up between us was you basically said mom I feel like I think when people see me they notice I'm black they also notice it might be something else in there but they can acknowledge that for the most part I'm black and I don't mm -hmm. think you can act black or talk black like a, there's a certain black type of thing to do but I think people can definitely tell that that's, that's a black girl. That's a black woman right there. And so sometimes you don't see it that, I guess. Yeah, that people see my blackness, but sometimes you try and discredit my blackness just because it's not the same as yours. And I can, I can see how the things that I have said feel that way. I mean, one thing I will say, though, looking back at how I raised you, you know, like to think that there would be this type of distinction between the two of us, I can honestly say I never, during the course of dating interracially and being married, you know, to a non-black man, it never crossed my mind what, like how I would raise you. Right. You know, my yeah, assumption was always that, you know, you would be biracial, but I've never had to actually answer the question what that would mean for you. Yeah, and I think for every biracial person, it kind of just depends on, you know, like environment, um, you know, who you're raised by, which parent is which race, if you have both parents, and um, personally, you know, I had you most of my life. I mean, my dad is here now, but I didn't grow up in a Hispanic country. Right. I, I mean, apparently I spoke Spanish, but who, who knows? <laughs> yeah. And, and but see, that's the place where it becomes is race. We know race is a construct. Right. So that's the place where you have to look at culture. Like as black people, we do a lot of things for the culture because I am a fully black woman. No one has ever been, I, there's nothing ambiguous about my blackness. You know, to me, because I am a black woman and a lot of things over the course of my life have changed. So I do gatekeep blackness. You know what I mean? Um, white people have the luxury of privilege being built into, you know, non-black people identify more often than not as white. And so they have the privilege of being able to gatekeep their whiteness with privilege. No one ever asks a white person if they're white or what they are unless they appear to have been touched by blackness in some way. So it's like when I see you, I don't see the same thing I am. And so I think sometimes I'm guilty of that same thing because you've been raised completely in black culture. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, I think that's the thing right there is that I'm not what you are. And mm -hmm. I think a big part of accepting my 
uh, of accepting who I am is accepting that we're not the same and we're never going to be the same. And even though I've grown up around you and my aunts and my uncle and my cousins mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've grown up in like, you know, primarily black places. I've gone to primarily black schools for mm -hmm. the most part. I'm not like you and I never will be. And I think a big part of accepting that is accepting I'll never have the experiences that you have of, you know, being fully black and people mm -hmm. not coming up to you, asking you, like, what you are, like, a human. Yeah, <laughs> but see, that's the place, too, where, because as a fully black, dark-skinned woman, I have the intersectionality of all the isms. Racism, sex, sexism, colorism, texturism. So you're never going to experience blackness like I do, but that's why... It kind of upsets me sometimes when you feel like I'm discrediting your blackness when you just basically said that they're not the same kind of blackness. I feel like it takes power away from what your blackness is to make ours synonymous. Right. So I think discrediting might not be the right word, but like maybe invalidating maybe? Because okay. it's like if you go through trauma, your trauma is just because of physical. The no, mm -hmm. no, I'm like just an example. Your trauma is physical. My trauma is mentally. Mm -hmm. It's both trauma. Yours isn't worse than mine. Okay. It's not the same thing, but you're still both hurt over it. Right. You still both got to heal from that, and you still both have to live with this trauma in your life. Mm -hmm. And just because it's not the same doesn't mean you're you're more traumatized or I'm less traumatized. It's still traumatizing. Here's the thing. Our experiences are different, not just because of our race, you know, our racial identity, but also because of the generation that we're growing up in right. as well. Do you think that, because I know for, for me growing up, because whiteness was gatekept at such a high rate, biracials had no choice but to be black. That's just how they were. And a lot of the biracials back then were black mother biracials because they were products of like rapes or, you know, different types of relationships. Whereas now you have so many more white women raising biologically black biracial children. How does that affect how you feel like your blackness is experienced or expressed in the, in the culture? Well, um... I'm I'm not sure. I think. Do you think you're different from white biracial, white I, mom biracial? I do. I think that now it's like cool to be black and cool to have you know some type of hip to you, and so I think now it's like fashionable kind. Of. Right. I think it's easier for biracial kids or just like any type of kids with any type of black in them they'd be like oh well you know i'm 14 percent black so you know i can say the n word mm -hmm. and it's like no yeah. <laughs> um so i think now it's easier for people to accept some type of black identity mm -hmm. especially in biracial kids because you know i'm black but there are some kids with white moms who say i'm black too and our black is not the same so, thing mm -hmm. Our yeah. black is not the same, same thing, thing. Mm -hmm. but the, it's still black. Like, yeah. yeah, and I think that's a, your point is we can't invalidate it, that experience. But this is what I'm experiencing right. as someone outside of the biracial community. When there was no place for biracials to be but black, you know, we embraced it. Yeah. And now I kind of feel like the only way that white privilege holds on to power is that, you know, they periodically have to, like, pick groups of people to include. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it used to be that Native Americans couldn't be, you know, Hispanics couldn't be white. But then one day they were like, oh, it's more of them than it is of us, so let's let some people in. And so I feel like as we're getting more white mom biracials, it's like biracials want their own group now. Like, it's like, we're not really black we're not really white, we're something else. We want our own category, which is fine. I mean, don't get me wrong, that's fine, but it, I think it dilutes something in y'all to not 
identify with the blackness in that way. So, Is, did that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, like I said at the beginning, I can't speak for any other biracial person. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, But I do want you to speak as a member. Right. Um, I think that that's an interesting topic. So... I like let me let me qualify for just one second. Okay. I don't want to keep interrupting you, but it's like how being a woman was like a trash thing to be, like a weak right. thing, all that, until all of a sudden you had this big transgender movement. And it was like all this male privilege came into being a woman and it was like you're gonna respect me as a woman because men can bring that type of privilege. And I feel like that's what happened when you had like more white women that were mothering the biracial children. It, like an element of white privilege came in. So that's why right. I was asking. Um, I think that, well, when I was in middle school, I, for the most part, a lot of my elementaries were in black neighborhoods. Like it was. Yeah, you've been socialized black. Right. So starting what sixth grade I moved we moved to South Carolina and I was in a primarily white school mm -hmm. and so before then you know people used to come up to me and ask me if I was like Indian which I think that was more with my hair than like just my skin color and but I'm like no I'm black okay <laughs> but um I I knew I was black I knew I was Mexican too and you know um it used to be a thing in elementary to not only be black. Like, mm -hmm. you'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm black. And, you know, my mom's half Indian and my granddad's got, like, one third Asian. So, you know, like. Yeah. But um, I, I kind of grew out of that. But when I moved to um, South Carolina, it wasn't really, like, cool mm -hmm. to be. It it's It's hard to explain because... They, the people there loved black culture, but they did not like black people. Mm -hmm. and did you so, feel like it was more black and white? It definitely was. Yeah. Um, I remember I had a set of black friends mm -hmm. and I had a set of white friends. And so the black kids were cool because there were only like five or ten of them in my grade. Mm -hmm. And they used to hang out with the white kids, but they stayed to themselves. So they were cool in their group, and the white kids were cool just around the whole city. Yeah. So, like, you know, I would try and fit in with them, but I, I never really fit in. But I would try and be like, oh, yeah, you know, guys, like, what are we doing? Or, yeah, cool. Like, But then I would be with my black friends, and I didn't fit in either because, yeah. you know, not only was it black and white, it was, like, poor and very rich. Yeah. So, yeah. it was, like, and, like, also a whole nother like thing that adds on to it is like class because we're mm -hmm. we were pretty like middle class right so i've lived in the suburbs most of my, my life, life other mm -hmm. than when i was there and mm -hmm. so those kids have been used to that i wasn't really used to that and these kids have been used, used to, to being yeah. yeah and so i also didn't fit in with these black kids because i wasn't black enough and because i wasn't Right, it's like it's like the girls was normal anyway. Right, you was you weren't hood enough for the. How does it sound now? Too proper for the black kids, and too black for the Mexicans. Too square to be a hood nigga. What's normal anyway? I didn't fit into either of those, so I found myself like I'm also Gemini. So it wasn't hard, but you I also said what I said. I'm also Gemini. Oh yeah, you are so also Gemini. It wasn't hard. Master code switches. <laughs> right, it wasn't hard, but it definitely was damaging to have to find myself splitting like four different ways. Like I, I would hang out with my cousins, and I would have like this weird accent, and Caleb used to be like, "Why do you talk like that?" Yeah. <laughs> I'm like. What is you talking about? I don't talk no type of way. Like, <laughs> so, um, like, if I, like, I would try and split and mm -hmm. be this type of way for both of these people just to feel like I fit in someplace. And I didn't fit in either way. Mm -hmm. um, so I understand the, the wanting to have a different category. 
um, of just being like, you know, I'm not a part of any world and that's what makes me special is because I can be both or I can be none or I can be one or I can be, and I used to feel that way until I came back here and went to a primarily black school and now go to a primarily black high school and realize my whole life, my whole culture has been this one thing and mm -hmm. Every once in a while, I'll have just a little bit of like, oh, your Spanish accent is really good. And I don't speak not, none of it. And so, like, it it can make you want to be a part of both worlds. Mm -hmm. And I think for some biracials, that's completely fair. Yeah, because yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Do you think if you had been raised... Because, see, here's my, my take on it. It's really culture versus race. Right. Because like you said, most of the code switching you do is is because of me. Like even though I was a black raising you, I grew up in the suburbs. You right. know what I'm saying? See, like you grew up around I white kids. never had, you know, a forty ounce in my life or grew up around somebody <laughs> that drank one. You know what I mean? So it's like I went to an HBCU. And right. experienced a whole lot of, you know, sure you're you not black enough. Culture and, shock. Yeah, yeah, tons of culture shock. Like, why do you talk like that? People right. say that to me all the time. You yeah. know what I mean? And it has nothing to do with anybody mistaking me for any race. All of the alternative and rock music you listen to, I introduce you to that. Right. And so I have been a person who has been black living outside of that world as well. And that's why I say, you know, like when you're black in a white culture, you're the cool kid, you know, right. and it's tough going from that to being in an HBCU where I was the lame kid it, and have been called a lame, which is like, uh, so then it becomes what really is blackness then right. at that point. Do you think if you were raised culturally Mexican, you would still feel that same connection to blackness? Um, I do. I think because of the generation I'm in that it's now like cool to be black and it's like encouraging to I well I think because of my skin color I there's no way I could be fully involved in that culture I think I was do still, you think you experience a certain amount of privilege because of your skin color yes and no there's Definitely. Do um, you feel like you get like commoditized? I know that's not a word, but do you think that because of the value some other people place on your skin color, that do you think any of that is built into the way you identify? Um, no. I think I definitely know that like colorism is a thing, and I feel like you don't notice that I noticed that because I am light skinned and that's some type of like badge yeah that's some type of like super cool thing like you're on top of everybody but I've also had you in my life as a dark skinned woman and noticed that it's like some type of like black girl hierarchy yeah and that like skins get prioritized yeah. over well not prioritized like no you can say like don't don't worry about them you can say <laughs> what you feel like um over we've brown skins it. and dark skins and yeah even, and we've experienced that right. there are some people that play so much because what it is is proximity to whiteness Right. And they really place so much value on white skin that however closer you can get to it, that is your value and that is your work. But, you know, I say this because as much as I have experienced that kind of colorism, I think we as women have to get past whatever this is and stop allowing ourselves to be commoditized or whatever in that way anyway because I have some men say that to me they're like I don't date light skinned women all I date is dark skinned women because right. light skinned women are so high maintenance and they think they all that so and that's I'm, a form of colorism too it is but see my thing is I'm about to be high maintenance then because right. is it really about the color of a woman's skin like don't tell me I have more value than a light skinned woman because I'm gonna like scrape the bottom of the barrel like what does that say about you right it's like I've grown up with dark skinned mother and I've grown up around dark skinned women my whole life. 
So some guy coming up to me telling me like, oh, you look so, you know, because you're light skinned, you know, you got those like Asian eyes. I've had that for a while. I don't, I don't know. But you have that. So, yeah. But like, it's, you're not going to win brownie points with me by saying that. Like, right. you're so excited. You look so, like that, as somebody who's grown up around dark skinned women who are great, they're like awesome, amazing. And there's nothing less valuable about them than me. Wait. <laughs> yeah, you said it right. Yeah, it's it's not gonna make me like you more. Like, think that's a compliment. Like, mm. you sound corny. Yeah, <laughs> but the crazy part about it is more often than not, it's coming out of the mouth of somebody that's dark. So right. They always that skin. much. Exactly. If you place that much value on like skin, what does that say about what you think about yourself? Right. But it's, those it's are definitely self hate. Right. But that's why I always want to have these open dialogues and open questions with you and not just for you to tell me how you feel but to actually just open that up and make sure that you're identifying and validating your own feeling right because the thing of it is is that this is a work in progress just between us two but also between you know we're watching this kind of break out between black women and biracial women all of it stems back to the value that men are telling us to have in our in ourselves in comparison to their desirability and we're not really looking at who we are as people like I might be high maintenance and dark skin right. you might be low maintenance and light skin I but am. you're not that you're not I am you're not I anyway, am. but you're not that <laughs> way as a product of the color of yeah. your skin you know like you said you was raised by dark skin women so someone looks at you and makes so many assumptions about who you are or what you think so I wanted to give you that opportunity to define your blackness for yourself yeah I think that's really the divide between biracials with black moms and biracials with white moms. I think a lot of biracial women who have white moms are raised on that type of thinking where it's like, oh, you know, you're pretty because you have light skin and you have good hair and you have... Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a certain part in them that idealizes what their children are right. on both sides. Like, black moms that think, you know, having biracial children is this raised up. Right. But I think... Also, white women who are like, oh, I want a light-skinned baby with blue eyes and, yeah. you know, curly, loose hair. I think a lot of it is, um, like, fetishizing yeah. black kids yeah, yeah, yeah. and trying to build this black but not too black type of child and then that's put into them yeah. where they're having this like cr like identi identity crisis because they're like my mom is white i'm raised around white people mm -hmm. but i'm black you can yeah. tell by my skin yeah. color and it's crazy because your experience like growing up without your dad is usually what a child with a black father would experience you see what i mean right. so it's like i think it's the same way that like white women struggle to be able to raise children that identify with their blackness and like i said i can't speak for them but i know like just bringing this all back to like a head and really expressing to you my purpose for wanting to do this podcast with you i just never considered Right. That I never like consider what it about. was. Yeah, and what it would be like for your black experience. I never considered what your black experience would be like living between those two worlds. Like I think sometimes we think the culture is enough. Right. To be black, and I had never even experienced that in my own life. So I don't know what made me think that you know blackness would be just this one thing for you i had said it to you the other night that you know how other people perceive me has nothing to do with me like if they think i'm not black enough or i'm too black to be mm -hmm. this light or whatever whatever um it has nothing to do with me i think i definitely during middle school that was what was so hard for me was knowing where i fit in and it wasn't until i accepted in myself that I am a black woman, but I, I've i never said, like, I am a Hispanic woman. And, like, I've never said those words out loud or felt like that in my head. And I, I've i never really thought about it until today. Yeah. <laughs> like, I would, I, I've never felt comfortable saying those words. Yeah. But if I wanted to, I could. 
Yeah, but the thing is, is um, you could, but see, there's if a gatekeeper be, yeah, for his, being that. Hispanic, and that's that's the that's the thing because a child with a white mother and a black father will always be accepted as being black, right. even if they're dis, even if they're not able to access whiteness, this is always available for them. Right. So that kind of brings me to this point which is as i have begun to embrace my blankness and what that means more and more because unfortunately all of us are coming up out of a certain amount of self-hatred it just doesn't matter if you were a kid with a black parent in the 80s that moved you out to the suburbs for a better school and a better life there was a certain element of i can't get what i need to raise my child within the black race and the black culture and the black neighborhood and the black school which we should have always been educating our kids at home but a lot of us said we did it for the schools or we did it for safe neighborhoods but we didn't clean up our own neighborhoods right. so for me as i've been delving into my blackness i feel like it's been creating a divide between how i see myself now and how i see you and that divide was never there when I had you and when I was raising you up and when I was married to, you know, a non-black man and when I just felt like there was this one love, one society and, you know, now that we're learning so much more about black culture and learning so much more about, um, you know, our roots and blackness is something that we've sold to every single community at the lowest bid now that we're trying to reclaim that and and make blackness this thing that can be gate kept in and that's valuable to us do you feel like you're now being and i'm this is about a conversation between me and you do you feel now as you see me embracing that and how that affects our dynamic do you feel kind of pushed out of blackness or do you feel like it's just like, I'm not gonna tell you how to feel, but do you feel that? Um, no, uh, not at all. Um, I think how you identify yourself is completely within you. Now you have outside factors that, of course, factor into it a little bit, but I think once I stop trying to fit in or be something or, you know, be around, kind of that I could accept who I was just for me within me I didn't have to tell you that I feel black enough and mm -hmm. I didn't have to tell um anybody that I didn't feel Hispanic enough or I didn't feel this type of way or I like I could accept within myself and I think that's really for anybody who's watching and biracial or whatever or anybody i think yeah definitely definitely that, i identify with what you're saying right that you shouldn't rely on validation from other people in anything but especially in your identity and your race well i'm just say your identity because it's yours so if you say that you feel black enough or you don't or you know like it's completely within you to identify how you feel and I felt like I was at times not accepted as black but it's I'm black and I know that I don't have to rely on other people to accept that too mm -hmm. because at the end of the day they can be who they are who they are and nobody cares really right I feel like the best thing that I can do to help you identify yourself as a black woman I think is, it should be who you are that's if you let me say it. no I, I was think, gonna say is I think the best example that I can give you that helps you find your way to whatever it is that you are and want to be is just being a strong black woman is just being rooted in my identity as being a black woman and allowing you to be able to see what that is even if it is something different than your blackness yeah. i just think that me being fully embraced in what my blackness is and you being able to see me walk that out gives color and depth to your blackness yeah um definitely i think the best way to raise a black woman is by being one um because i mean you can't be anything else and raise something like you can't be a woman and raise a man i mean yeah. you can try but 
it's never yeah. really. Gone. I mean, you can raise them, but you can't do the man training. Right, and so I think the it's the like best... trying to be a wolf raising a duck. Like... Right. So I I think the best way is by being you and leading the example is this is what the strong black women in my community do. And so I think definitely being raised around strong black women is what helped my identity a mm -hmm. lot. And I also think just especially like 2020 during the um like Black Lives Matter movement and stuff. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! solidified in my decision like this is who I am this is my culture and I need to step up step up and be an activist mm -hmm. or step up and just acknowledge that you know this is who I am and there are unfair standards or like mm -hmm. classes in this world or in this country yeah. and that whatever you know out of whatever privilege I have that I can help you know right. but that's what I was gonna say I think that that feeling that we have to, you know, make those distinctions come from white like, privilege. You know, just like certain distinctions we have come from male privilege, from males saying, well, we like women that are like, you need to be more like this. You should be wearing straight hair because we like the women with straight hair. You know, I think a lot of those definitions of divisions that we, we have come from that. But let me ask you that. That brings me to another question. Do you feel like because you're biracial, like, because I noticed, just like in the older, you know, context, Frederick Douglass, you know, it's believed that his father was a white man and W.E.D. Du Bois and some of these people were biracial people that were really like out in front, like doing big things. Did you things. know the director of the FBI during like, um... Hoover or something like that? Yeah, he's black. He is a black man. Yeah, but... Well, we <laughs> know a lot of black people... <laughs> wreck the movement okay yeah. black people that hate blackness got out there and did a bunch of co-intel pro stuff so we already know that but you know that's all for validation of the white man exactly but, but that's a, a whole other, other conversation <laughs> but that's why i was going to ask do you feel like as a biracial you have to go above and beyond to prove your blackness sometimes yes i think definitely i i was gonna say at a certain point but i think yeah i to be black when you're not black, I don't know how to completely black. Yeah, to be completely black, you have to like over exude how over exude, whatever the word is, how black you are, how like down with the brothers and sisters you are. When really, I feel like that's also looking for validation mm -hmm. out of other people because if you do what you feel like you need to do for your community and you say how you feel and you just be who you are that should be enough for you because Represent yeah mm -hmm. i think definitely a lot a lot of people look for validation from other things whether it's like likes on instagram or that's a good point and i think the black community is a good place to like allying with us is a good place to, to clout chase it is an easy way to get that validation no matter what race you are right you know and yeah, I think definitely for biracial kids, there's a like want to fit in someplace. And as you said, you know, the black community is so like Yeah, we don't have any gatekeepers. Right. But so, I think black women are starting to gatekeep being a black woman and that's what makes me concerned for you. Yeah. And how that's gonna affect your your place, if you will. Well, you know, I have never really had an issue with other people seeing 
me as at least some part black even mm -hmm. if i wasn't black enough or i act white or whatever whatever i've never really had too much of an issue with people seeing that i'm black in some type of yeah. way so yeah. i think like before i think you see my blackness as different just because you're a fully black woman who raised a not fully black woman and so mm -hmm. I think you definitely see it different than other people would on the outside. outside. Yeah. Yeah. But I just want to have those transparent conversations with you. And I want you to understand what the blackness is and what it means to us as black women and why there is times where there's that defensiveness. But I do think you made some really great and valid points as we're, you know, closing out this podcast to say that all of that is being driven by outside validation and I think so many black women feel the need in response to black men placing such a low value on black women in this time to now all of a sudden be these gatekeepers but if we mean what we say when we say that we don't want to be dishonored and disrespected by our own black men a big part of that is also not letting that divide be there also not turning our vitriol against them on women like you who do identify as black for cultural reasons you know and make it a racial issue when it's not they give so much power to white privilege they may give so much power to men who are already trying to well you know hold on there i think when you say it like that you allow certain type of people who are like, well, I grew up around black people, so, you know, I can say this, or I can sure. do this. You open that conversation up for them. When, you know, I find myself gatekeeping blackness too. Um, yeah. Definitely when I see... Because you're right, white people grow up around black people and, and all of a sudden think yeah, they're black. And, you know, um, I saw this thing on Twitter and it was saying how, like, people use AAV. Do you know what that is? It's like um, African American vernacular Natural. English, yeah. somewhere like that. Um, Ebonics. That's what we called it when much. I was growing up. Ebonics. Uh, pretty much, yeah. Um, that when they use it, they have. Jeez, y'all would come up with an acronym for anything. Carry on. <laughs> that um, when certain people use it, it sounds the same. Mm -hmm. And so when. Um, certain people are like well i grew up around black people you know i can talk like this they all sound the same and so that's another thing but i think when you say it that it's just culturally and not racially that you let other people in the conversation that shouldn't be in there because it is racially too um i'm half black you're fully black i'm sure dad would say he got three percent or something but that, that's not the point but when you have people like um People whose like grandparents were black and then like their kids were biracial yeah, and then and they're, they're yeah and they claim that one eighth whatever that yeah, is like I, 16th. yeah I mean you know I think it it also depends on your skin color too because I it, think it just really de depend to me it depends on how you identify if but you know if the if the war is coming tomorrow you know right. I just need to know what side you're on. Yeah, I I think you know for all of the rest of that stuff, I just need to know what side you're on. And I've never switched sides. I've never. No, no, no. Like, I'm saying that to no, anybody. Yeah, like, to anybody, because like you said, it's tons of people that think that one eight black make a difference. Well, okay, vote with me. You know, stand with me. You know, that's that's what I need to know. Is is it does your blackness amount to any type of actual action in the community? Because it's a lot of one hundred percent two parent black people that are not for the culture, that are not for the you know. But you know how you can tell those people is they'll say they got like a great grandfather who was like born in Europe or you know he's yeah. like one third. Yeah. They'll I mean, try it goes like, both ways. Yeah. Well, what? it goes both ways. But that's my point. The black experience is not a monolith. So let me yeah. ask you this. Will you come back with me and explore this topic more in depth on another episode? 
Of course. <laughs> well, thank you for being my guest yes. and coming on today. And just a little closing note there. <laughs> Enough. I want to say that anybody who's ever struggling with their identity, that it's something that you have to figure out yourself. That there's nobody who can come up to you and tell you what you are. And I think that's, you know, you may not agree, but with your sexuality, with your, like, gender, mm -hmm. too, I think you have to be the person to say that this is who I am. And nobody can tell you that what they think well people can tell you what they think and i well, think that, I mean, that it no 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 i know but it's a caveat to what you're saying right. but i think like you said just fighting for your own identity is going to look different for different people but i do think to a certain extent like i said women have a right to gatekeep gender black people have a right that you you see how it becomes at a certain point now like you just said you let people in and then you let arguments in so it's like it's like you have to be able to see it both ways. You know, you have to be able to be open enough to see it both ways and to know that your identifying yourself is going to be a lifelong thing. Because right. there are certain things that I see totally differently now, 20 years later, than what I thought about the world when I didn't know the world. I didn't know myself in it because there was still so much more to learn about the world. So I think you're off to a good start. I just always like to have these conversations with you just to see where you are and to be able to give you those gauges, you know, to make sure you're being honest with yourself and transparent with yourself because that's the biggest part of getting to your identity and who right. you really are is having those conversations and that honesty. And I want to encourage you to continue to be courageous in developing what your identity is never let that be something like you said that's a label that people put on you. yeah now there's gonna be parameters like I said that's why I always want to prepare you for that because I see the shift in the changing of the tide and how black women are beginning to view themselves and I know that's gonna affect you it's gonna have an effect on you because it's having an effect on the culture so I I think there are like you know fully black people who are light-skinned too and so I I well, I don't think I know. Yeah, and, that's um, different than colorism, though. You are actually biracial. Yeah, but I mean, I think with how it's changing is more more inclusive instead yeah, of less inclusive. That's section. what I was gonna say, actually. Yeah. Okay, but see, on my section, like when we talking about this black experience, it doesn't look like that to me. Right. That's not what I'm seeing. Well, and so that's why, you know, I just wanted to have the conversation because we can be representative of those populations and having that conversation that sometimes doesn't always get had on a bigger level because it's about desirability or, you know, colorism and, you know, all these different things where it's like just be a biracial woman talking to a black woman and what we feel like our commonality is or our differences is, differences are or where we can see ourselves overlapping and what your blackness is and what my blackness is doesn't have to be the same, but it can still be complimentary. Mm -hmm. Because my so blackness true. but got your blackness. Right. You didn't notice what you said. What I just say? Nothing. <laughs> what I just say? No. What I just say. You so like, I can wrap this up. We've been here for almost an hour. I you like be, so. me being a black woman and you being a biracial woman. When I just spent this whole time saying I was a black woman. Well, it's A black me. woman who is biracial. Okay, you are a black woman <laughs> who's biracial. I mean, okay. you, can, you can add that if you want to, but yeah, I, that's I what I'm saying. Because see, that's the, for me to say that I'm a black woman doesn't have any other like sponsorships or endorsements to it. So it's hard for me, even in that, to understand it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's what we're here for to have those conversations. Because you can tell me there are certain things about my blackness that you don't understand, and that shouldn't be offensive to me. You'll never know what it's like to have. The whole spectrum tell you you don't have value. People look just like you. Same skin color. Look you in your face and say you are too dark. You'll never hear that. and You'll never know how that, how that encodes in your DNA and changes you organically in, in the way that you identify yourself. So 
you know, that's something in my, my blackness that's not necessarily in your blackness. But like I said, I've known what it's like to live between those two worlds, but not be denied access to one that I actually, you know. So it's a complex conversation and I just want to have those conversations with us and allow other people to see us having that conversation because they may not have that proximity. Right. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, it so was you're a black to... woman. It's <laughs> my right show. It was great to have this conversation with you and I'm yeah. just glad that you could share it on your platform with other people. And I'm glad that you came to have it with me and felt comfortable, you know, sharing that side of you because there are people who know you that may see it and didn't know that you felt that way or may feel now like they're able to come to certain judgments about you. So it's very courageous to be the one, like you said, mm -hmm. to own your own identity and tell it in your own terms. So yeah. <laughs> I will see you next time, you know, in the kitchen. Until then, be unplugged. You know, unplugged from our way of thinking about race and what it is so that we can be unbothered. You know, find our own identity and be unleashed. So, until the next episode, I will see you in the comments. Class is now dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> I got that part. You're not niggas. <laughs>